Uh, and then Bobby is at a, uh, a wedding tonight. Um, you guys remember Shannon? Shannon visited our church a few times. Uh, he and his fiance are, are getting married this evening. Hopefully not in a tornado. And uh, then the Friday, or excuse me, the Sunday after that, we have our church breakfast. What do you guys think of our church breakfast so far? Yummy. Yay. Yummy? Yummy. Got one person clap. I guess it sucks. Yeah? Hey, I think it's good, man. Uh, so, and then uh, Sandy asked me to announce that we have ladies' night next Friday. And if you can listen closely, you hear the rain right now. I needed a bike wash anyway, so it's good. But, uh, yeah, there you go. And uh, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. We got some long lost uh, family members up here. Good to see you guys. And, uh, and then, as Jim said, we need to keep Willie in prayer. I guess it just happened uh, before service. So keep Willie in your prayer. And uh, hopefully he'll uh, come out of that stronger than when he went in, you know? So with that, Big Jim Nolan, take it away! Oh, boy. <laughs> it's a song that I've always liked. And, and uh, really weird. Tell me.
Oh, yes, I do, says the little girl. And he's upstairs with mommy right now. Another brief pause. Well, okay. Can you do daddy a favor? Can you put the phone down and go tell mommy that daddy's car is pulling up the driveway right now? Okay, daddy, says the little girl. A few minutes later, the girl comes back to the phone. Okay, daddy, I did it. And what did mommy say, said the man. Well, for some reason, she jumped out of bed and ran across the room screaming. She tripped over the rug and hit her head on the dresser, and now she's not moving. Oh, no, says the man. What about your Uncle Paul? Well, he got really scared and jumped out of the window and landed in the swimming pool. I guess he didn't realize that you had drained the water to clean it, so he hit the bottom, and he's not moving either. <laughs> now there was a long pause. Then the man says, hold on, swimming pool? Is this 4865731? No, says the little girl, this is 4865732. Oh, I'm sorry, says the man, I must have the wrong number. <laughs> True story. True story. All right, so a man and his wife have been arguing at home all day. I know you guys don't know about this, okay? Nobody in here knows what it's like to argue with their spouse. So just imagine it, okay? So, so they're at home, and they've been arguing, and they decided that they're going to give each other the silent treatment. I, I had a friend one time called that quiet time. We had a little quiet time, right? So, um, so as they are heading to bed, the man realizes that he has to be up early because of a business flight at 5 o'clock. Not wanting to be the first one to break the silence and lose, he, write, he wrote on a, a piece of paper and he put, please wake me up at 4 a.m. And he placed the note on the kitchen table where he knew his wife would find it. The next morning, the man woke up at 9 a.m. He quickly realized that he had missed his flight and started running around the house frantic. Furious, he was about to go see why his wife hadn't waken him up when suddenly he looked down and saw the same piece of paper with his note lying next to the pillow. Underneath his note, the wife had written, it's 4 a.m., time to get up. <laughs> that was good, right? All right, so we are three weeks in to our series on the essentials of the Christian faith. What do you guys think so far? Woo! Yeah, good? Five weeks in? No, five things. Five things. Oh, five things. Oh, you're answering the question. All right. Don't get ahead of me. I'm all confused now. <laughs> I'm ADD. All right? What did you say? All right. So, you guys like it so far? Are we good? Yeah. If not, tough. So far, <laughs> we've answered the critical question that's all-encompassing. And that question is, what on earth am I here for? What are we here for? So, uh, as Sandy said, there are five things that we're here for, okay? What are those five things? Worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, evangelism. You guys are amazing! I know! I can't believe you remembered all those words so well. That's fantastic! It's almost as if it was on the slide behind me. So anyway, after we, we addressed that question, we came up with five answers as to what we were created for. Last week, in the same timing with Easter, we talked about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? And I gave you two reasons outside of the resurrection story that serve as proof that we can believe wholeheartedly in the resurrection. And those two reasons were what happened to Paul and Peter. What happened to Paul and Peter. If you remember, we said that when Jesus was arrested, persecuted, crucified, and ultimately murdered, Peter was terrified. He was so scared that he ran away and he denied even knowing Jesus three separate times. But then, after seeing Jesus after the resurrection, he became as bold as Russell Crowe in Gladiator. 
Okay? Right? Oh, you know I'm entertained! <laughs> All right? He was not bold, man. And he stood in the temple in Jerusalem and accused the very people who did it. All right? And you don't go from one of those extremes to the other without meeting Jesus Christ after the resurrection. Amen? Amen. All right. And then there was Paul. And I told you, I know that's not what he looked like because I got that off his Facebook page. All right? <laughs> and, and we talked about how Paul's name was originally Saul. Right? And Saul was a kingly name. That was the first king of, of Israel. And, and how Paul had had a perfect Jewish pedigree. He was even a Pharisee, right? Someone who was honored. He was, he was an honored rabbi, and he was respected everywhere he went. And he was a man of high status who hunted down and persecuted Christians. Okay? We know that he was there when Stephen was stoned to death. Okay? But Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus and changed his world forever. Okay? When Paul met Jesus, he gave up his life of privilege to follow him. He became the missionary to the Gentiles. Do you know how bad that is for you? I mean, Gentiles are like dogs, y'all. And we're Gentiles, by the way. Right? So, he became the missionary to the Gentiles. I bet you've never seen a pastor bark at service. That's, an, that's, an, that's awesome. So, so, he traveled all around the region spreading the gospel of Christ to the non-Jews. Okay? He was persecuted. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned. He was in prison. And at any point, he could have walked away. He could have walked away and had an easier life. But he chose Christ. And he chose to dedicate his life to spreading the good news of Jesus. And folks, that's not something that happens naturally. The only reason that someone like Paul gives up everything to follow Jesus is that he experienced something supernatural, right? Is that he met Jesus face to face. And folks, if those stories weren't proof enough, tonight we're going to go a little bit further. Are you ready? Yep. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. Tonight, we are going to talk about the deity of Jesus Christ and why that is important to our faith. Now, if you don't already know, the term deity means divine nature. Okay? Something that's divine. It's a term used for a god or goddess. It's another word for supernatural. Okay? Someone or something claiming a divine nature or who claims to be a deity is saying that he or she is God. Okay? Are you picking up what I'm laying down? Yeah. Now, as Christians, we believe in one deity in three different forms. All right? God the Father. Next slide. God the Father. God the Son. And God the Holy Spirit. And you're going to see this slide twice because it took me a long time to make it. Okay? Mm -hmm. But I've heard a lot of analogies from people trying to describe this. They're trying to describe God in three persons. And I think the most popular one is water. Who's heard this before? One person, two people, three people. All right. So good. I'm going to be teaching something new to some of y'all. All right? So, so the analogy is water, and water is water regardless of its form, right? Regardless of its form. And we know of three different types or forms of water. You can have water in its pure form, which is water. I know this is pretty theoretical, so uh, try to keep up. So we have, that was funny, just so you know. All right, so... You got water in its purest form, right? Raise you up, Jared. There we go, water, right? We also have solid form, which is also known as ice. Ice cube, right? 
The rapper? No. <laughs> so we have <laughs> solid water, which is ice, right? And then we finally yeah. have no. mist or or vapor, right? Water in its in its gas state. Alright? And it's the same formation of water that you see in a cloud or if you're making spaghetti on the stove, right? Same type thing. And these are three forms of water that are all the same chemical composition. The only difference is the temperature. The only difference is the temperature. All of them are two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. Thank you, Earth Science, right? Okay. So, if we use this analogy to describe God, you have three forms of the same Godhead. I told you to see that sign again. Okay? We call this what? The Trinity. Good. And you won't find that word anywhere in the Bible. Nope. We made that up. It's a churchianity word. Kind of like, you know, what a, we have this own, we have our own secret language in church, don't we? You know, we have, we have words like rapture. That's not in the Bible either. All right? We have words like election. That's not in the Bible. The word elect is in the Bible, but not election. All right? Uh, yeah. We, we have these, these secret languages, you know, that, that we have in church. And uh, one of these terms we actually studied in Bible study this past week. It was the term was baptismal regeneration. Yeah. Pretty big word. See what you're missing in Bible study? Look at that. There's people going, I'm glad I missed it. All right, so anyway, Jesus is claimed to be a deity is an extremely important artifact. Because if he wasn't God, and he was just another man, then there's nothing special about his sacrifice. Okay? Yeah. If he wasn't perfect, then his sacrifice wasn't pure enough to atone for our sins. And in the Old Testament, we read of how lambs or goats were sacrificed for sin, right? And if you know, if you've read the Old Testament, you'll know that they were given to the Lord in sacrifice, but they were always perfect. They never had a spot or blemish on them, okay? And first, we did this because we're called to give the very best of what we have to God, okay? We're called to give the best of what we have to God. But also, that's a picture of what would happen when Jesus was sacrificed. Okay? Something innocent would be sacrificed for sin. And when you think about that, when you look at that picture, it's hard to imagine that, isn't it? It's hard to imagine that something innocent had to die to cover for our sin. And it's the same picture that we see when Abraham was called by God to sacrifice his son Isaac, right? God was showing us pictures of Jesus long before Jesus came to earth. So based on the need for a perfect sacrifice, I think we can all agree that Jesus being God is critical to our faith, right? And ultimately to our salvation. Because if he's not God and there's no resurrection, then we're wasting a Saturday night, folks. I'm telling you right now. All right? And that's also why Jesus is known as the Lamb of God, if you didn't know that. Okay? So that brings us to our question tonight. How can we know for real that he was God? How can we know? That's right. Well... There are all kinds of miracles, right? That he performed in front of hundreds and thousands of people. These events are recorded and ultimately became what we call the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right, one another church he had anywhere? Synoptic. It means the same, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All right, here you go. Go use that with your friends. Hey, I was thinking maybe we'd have dinner tomorrow night and have the synoptic meal that we had last week. It means same. Yeah, don't do that. Anyway, how can we know that he's God? Well, if you remember, the first public miracle he performed was at a wedding. You guys remember that? All right? And at the wedding, he turned water into wine. How about that? Let's go ahead and read that story. It's found in 
John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read it to you. This is a really cool story. The next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples... Disciples. disciples. <laughs> Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivity, so Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. I love Jesus' response. Dear woman, that's not our problem. Jesus replied. That's a typical man for you, isn't it? That's not my problem. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, look, do whatever he tells you. She knew something was going to happen. Standing nearby were six stone water jugs. I can't talk tonight. Must be because I was drinking more service. Anyway, so that was a joke. So, six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons, right? Jesus told the servants, fill those jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants do, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign of Canaan and Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. How about that for a party trick? <laughs> huh? Hey, we're out of wine. God, God, go over Turn on the phone. Right? Turn on he the turned the, the water that they used for washing their hands and their feet into wine. Into a very fine wine. That's amazing. Now, that's a pretty cool story, but it doesn't necessarily prove that he was God, right? It's a cool story. It says his disciples believed in him after that. Well, how about this one then? Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. Listen to this. So they arrived in the region of Gesserides, across the lake of Galilee. As Jesus was climbing out of the boat, a man who was possessed by demons came out to meet him. That'll get your attention, right? I mean, that's how I picture it. You? What do you think? Yeah, all right, good. So we get greedy, so it doesn't matter. All right, so out comes this guy to greet him, possessed with demons. For a long time he had been homeless and naked, living in the tombs outside of town. Folks, living with dead people. <laughs> living with dead people. This guy was probably right. Okay? And he's crazy, he's running around. He's possessed by demons. Jesus had already commanded the evil spirit to come out of him. The spirit had often taken control of the man. Even when he was placed in the garden and put in chains and shackles, he simply broke them and rushed out into the wilderness, completely under the demon's power. Jesus demanded, what is your name? Legion, he replied, for he was filled with many demons. The demons kept begging Jesus not to send them to the bottomless pit. How bad is hell that the demons don't even want to be there. You ever thought about that? I mean, seriously. I, you read that and you're like, hey, please don't send us back to hell. Right? Anything. Put us in the pit. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby, and the demons begged him to let them enter into the pigs. So Jesus gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned. Yeah, that must have been fun. <laughs> when the herdsmen saw it, they fled to a nearby town and surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been freed from the demons. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Can you imagine that? You guys, who watched Ghostbusters? Who, the original one, right? Remember that guy? Remember? <laughs> yeah. Remember Moranis? That's what, that's what I'm thinking of, right? And then, and then, like, 
You come back and he's perfectly sane. Right? And he's hanging with Jesus and he's clothed. I'd be scared too. So, okay, we have the water and the wine thing. We have the demon possessed guy from Ghostbusters who was healed. Again, pretty cool stories. But David Blaine could probably do those things, right? What do you think? David Copperfield? There's two generations right there. See, the young people, David Blaine, and never mind. So, those stories are cool stories, but they still don't prove that Jesus was God, right? Right? Yeah. Well, let's keep going, because I know you're excited about the next story. How about the weather? How about the weather? Did you know that Jesus could tell the weather what to do? Yep. I tell you, if I could do that, we'd have a lot more people here tonight. I'm going to tell you that right now. So Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 22, listen to the story. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got in the boat and started out. And as they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. Be like Jesus. Take naps. Jesus took naps. All right. But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was thrown into the water, and they were in real danger. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. Suddenly the storm stopped, and all was gone. Then he asked them, where's your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They asked each other. When he gets a command, even the winds and waves obey him. That's next level stuff, isn't it? That is crazy, right? I mean, the guy stands up and tells the wind to stop. And it does. That's when you know you're in the right company. All right? He's got to be God, right? I mean, I'm sure you know that there are plenty of people who say these stories didn't happen. Right? You probably know that. Or they say it's just something that people tell to make us believe in Jesus. And let me give you one more. Okay, you ready? I'm going to give you one more. Mm -hmm. So in Matthew chapter 27, Jesus is to the point of death during the crucifixion. And this happened beginning in verse 50. Then Jesus shouted again and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks spill apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the other soldiers of the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. And they said, this man truly was the Son of God. That's pretty convincing, isn't it? The soldiers who were guarding him at the crucifixion witnessed what had happened when he died. And they even agreed that he must be God's son. And folks, when you see dead people, next slide, walking around, right? It's time to pay attention, all right? Because something supernatural is happening. When you see people walking out of the cemetery and walking over to Applebee's to get some ribs, you know something special is going on, okay? But I guess if you're a skeptic, then you could probably find a way to dismiss that one too, right? You probably just assume that it was another made up story. And everything we've read tonight as proof of Jesus' deity comes from this book, doesn't it? The stories that you've heard about Peter, Paul, and Mary. <laughs> I couldn't, I'll, I just slipped that one in there. Anyway, seriously though, the stories we've heard about Peter and Paul, Jesus turning water into wine, Jesus healing the demons possessed man, Jesus calming the storm, and finally the miracles of what happened when Jesus gave up his spirit at the cross. 
No matter which one we read, they all came from the Bible. And there are many, many more. Jesus brought a centurion's daughter back from the dead. He healed a blind man. He walked on water. He healed a leper. He healed a woman who had disease that made her bleed all the time. Right? He fed thousands and thousands of people with just a few loaves of bread and a few fish. Next slide. I mean, he did all these things, right? But listen, all those stories are from Scripture. So if you want to deny the deity of Jesus Christ, you can just deny that the Scriptures are authentic, right? You know, I've talked to atheists in the past who tell me the Bible is not proof because they don't believe it's real. So it's difficult to present the gospel to someone who denies the authenticity of this book. Where is it? Tonight, I'm going to share with you something that might change the discussion with people who deny the proof that's in Scripture. Okay? Something separate from the Scripture that's been proven scientifically without looking to the Bible. Something that when I learned it, strengthened my faith a lot. Okay? Are you ready? Yeah. That's me. Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Good. So, here we go. We're going to talk about one of the most debated points of the deity of Christ. And that is the virgin birth. Okay? Virgin birth. So you mean to tell me that the Holy Spirit got Mary pregnant, right? It's more likely Mary got knocked up from someone else, and this was a good cover, right? That's what I've heard, right? At least that's the argument I've gotten from non-believers. Well, let me ask you a question. Did you know that the blood of a mother and the blood of the mother's child as a baby, do not ever mix during pregnancy. Did you know that? Although the hereditary traits like hair color, eye color, they're all a combination of both the mother and the father, the actual blood that's in the baby does not come at all from the mother. Really? Come on, Frank, you're making Right? It's true. Go home and Google it. Look it up for yourself. The blood of a baby comes completely from the father and does not mix the mother until birth. And here's a quick way for you to know that this is true. Back in the 80s and the 90s, we had to deal with this new disease. It's gone by, with a, by a few names in the past. Uh, autoimmune deficiency syndrome, we called it AIDS, right? That was the first name. Now they call it human. Uh, immunodeficiency virus or HIV. I think they changed the name because of the negative stigma that goes along with AIDS. But over the years, scientists were battling this terrible disease. And what they learned was that a woman with HIV could have a baby without HIV if they took special precautions to make sure the blood didn't mix during birth. How's that possible? I mean, doesn't the child live inside of her? Doesn't the child grow and develop inside of her body? Yes. But the blood never comes into contact with the baby until the child's born. Look it up. Okay? Pretty cool, right? But why is that important for our teaching? Well, because if we know scientifically that the blood of a baby doesn't mix with the mother at all, then we can know if the Holy Spirit was truly the one who put Jesus inside of Mary, then it's completely possible that the blood of Jesus Christ was pure and was still 100% God. How cool is that? Yeah, pretty cool. So Jesus was completely human, yes. There's no doubt about that. But we can now see through science that it's possible that the blood of Jesus Christ was different 
than our own and was perfect. And listen, if it's possible that his biological makeup was truly supernatural, then you have to ask yourself, could it be real? I've talked to a lot of people about the truths of Christianity, and I've heard over and over, well, science says this, and science says that. You know, folks, I got two master's degrees. And I did them because I learned that anybody can get a master's degree, and anybody can get a PhD, all right? And just because you have letters behind your name doesn't mean that you're any smarter. And when you look at science, the majority of it is based on theory, okay? And you have to make certain assumptions that something is true in order to believe something else, all right? But there have been times, like this case, where science, science can prove that it's possible for Jesus to be 100% God. How crazy is that? I think it's pretty cool. You know, the same thing is true when you look at Jewish history. There's, you talk to people uh, that, that track the history in Israel, and they said, well, this, this group never lived here, and that's how I know the Bible isn't true, and this group never lived here. But yet, time after time, as archaeological studies happen more and more, they find that those people were there. I, I remember hearing in school, look, dinosaurs were there, they all died, man came, that's how it happened. All right? And then the two never coexisted. Well, recent archaeological studies over the past 10 years show Dinosaur footprints right next to human footprints. That's interesting. You know, and if you were to go back years and years ago, science would tell you that the earth was flat. You laugh, but it's true. Right? Science used to tell you that when you were sick, they needed to drain your blood out of you. Right? This is all based on theory, folks. God created us. And he created a way for us to come to him. And right here through science, I'm showing you outside of the Bible how that's possible. Atheists would love to discount this. They'd say, nah, that's crazy. You got proof? You see, it's easy to dismiss these stories. It's easy to dismiss that Jesus was God if you have no physical proof. And people look for ways to dismiss it. I know I did. Because if you can deny God is real, then you don't have to be accountable for anything, right? But here we see, through science, that the story of the virgin birth is possible. And the blood of Jesus that was put into Mary by God as a child is 100% God. And if that's true, then we have to look at things a little differently, don't we? What I'm trying to do in this series is show you why we believe what we believe as Christians apart from just reading Scripture. Okay? Now, don't misunderstand me. You have to have scripture in order to understand the context of everything. But I showed you last week how the reactions, the human emotions from Peter and Paul were contrary to what they should have been unless they had an encounter with Jesus Christ after he died. And we know our humanity. We know how we be. So we know that that's true. People don't do the things they do unless something happens, right? And then this week, we went through Jesus' miracles. 
Jesus claims he's God, but it's all from this book. But I just showed you, scientifically, look it up, that it's possible for Jesus to be 100% God and 100% man. That changes the game a little bit, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, I used to be in charge of the church sign at my church in New York, which I don't know if that was too smart. <laughs> But I had free reign to put anything I wanted on the sign. And the one that got the most responses and the ones that people actually came to the church as a result of the sign is I put a simple question. What if it's true? What if it's true? Folks, most people, if not all of you, are Christians in here. And you believe it's true. But there are people all around you that think that this is a bunch of people. They think you're crazy going to church. You must be involved in some kind of cult. Right? They think you're crazy for giving God the best of what you have. But when you have proof like this, it isn't so crazy anymore, is it? And if they can just see the truth, because we tell them these things, how different might it be for them? So if we know that it's possible, and we ask ourselves, could it be true? And if it's true, then are all the miracles and stories we've heard about Jesus true? And if they are, then we have to do something about it, amen? We have to do something about it. You know, I used to drive a 1981 Chevy Chevette. I was a high roller. All right? People would come out, how's the vet? I'm like, that's doing good, right? It would shake at 65. It really would. Okay? I, I, I fixed things by doing other things. Like I had a big hole in the dash, and I glued a wood mouse to that company. I mean, that's how I fixed things, right? So anyway, I had this car, and I was styling. And... I never had to change it once. <laughs> Ever. Never had to change your oil. And it seemed to work fine. Right? I just keep driving it. <laughs> and everything was fine until one day it wasn't anymore. Okay? And that's when I learned the truth about maintenance, okay? <laughs> and I ended up paying a lot of money to get a Chevy Chevette fixed, all right? What's my point here? You will change what you do if you know the truth about something, won't you? It'll change what you do. That's our goal, folks, is to tell people the good news so that the blind see. And when they see, just like was the case in our lives, they'll change what they do because they know more than they knew before. So there's one thing that we have to do before we leave tonight, and that is to explain how someone comes to the Lord Jesus. We do that every service. And we do that because I grew up in churches where that was not presented clearly. And so I always want to make sure that during a church gathering, we tell people how to come to the Lord. In Romans 3.23, Scripture tells us that everyone has sinned. Did you know you're a sinner? Yep. Did you know? Scripture always asks me, do you know Jesus? I say, yeah, I do. Yeah. Good. Do you know you're a sinner? That's my question. Do you know you're a sinner? Well, guess what? With that sin, we can't be with God. Because he's perfect and we're not. We just learned that he is perfect, right? For the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But it's not automatic. You don't get to just go to heaven and get Jesus atoning sacrifice because you're an American. You don't get to go to heaven because your daddy was about to preach. You 
don't get to go to heaven because your uncle was a deacon. It doesn't work that way. You have to call out to God yourself. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. And it's by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. Romans 10, 13 or whosoever, anybody, me too, you too, who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Which can be. If you're here tonight and you've already done that, praise God. But the question is, are you living your life as though this were real? Are you living your life? Are you telling people as if their life is dependent on it because it does. I'm going to be up here tonight for a couple minutes. If you want to pray, I'll pray with you. We don't have any background music. But I'll pray with you if you want to pray. After that, Jen's going to come up and pray for any prayers we have any prayer requests. And we're going to be this one. But I always want to give people the chance to open their heart to prayer if they need it. You going to play something, Michael? I was looking for the mic, Regen. So I'm up here. We're going to sit in this awkward silence. And I want you to imagine the most beautiful music that you've ever heard from. But if you need prayer, come on. Thank you.